Hey, Hope, welcome to the show. As a way of getting started, tell us a little bit about yourself. Great. Thank you, Brian, for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity and looking forward to it. Um, so yeah, I've been in B2B sales in, in this business for over 25 years. I started my career at General Electric and I got my start in enterprise sales very, very early as an early talent while still getting my degree. I was going down the solution consulting path and eventually wanted to be in sales like all of my mentors that I'd been working with. And I had some great leaders who took a chance on me even before I felt I was ready. And Bob Brooks and Julie Walker, if you're out there listening, thank you so much. Um, and Bob knew that I would eventually figure this out. Um, so even though I didn't feel I was ready, he knew I was. And one of the things that I was doing while I worked at GE, I was moonlighting as a rock star interviewer for a local <laughs> TV show. So, Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Bob knew that I was not going to have any kind of call reluctance whatsoever. Yeah. And he knew I wasn't going to be afraid to call on CEOs because they were really, no, I was not intimidated or there was, it was no big deal to me at the time because I'd been sitting next to folks like Tom Petty and LA Guns, you know, interviewing them for a TV show. So uh, it, it all worked out. <laughs> wow. That's a pretty good, or certainly an interesting background. Now, how did you get into interviewing rock stars? Um, it, it was just uh, kind of like the opportunity with you. I saw something posted and I said, hey, I'd love to do that. I yeah. saw it in the local newspaper. It was the local, you know, rock magazine. They were calling for interviewers and, uh, and I signed up and um, they hired me for free. I would have paid them to do it. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's how I got into it. Who was the most famous person you interviewed? My favorite was Tom Petty. Tom Petty, yeah. That was my cool. favorite interview. Yeah. And how'd you like sales once you got into it? So I really found my calling. Um, I got into it and I never got out. It's the only role I ever see myself in. Yeah. Um, and and for, for many years, I have um, performed in some sales leadership roles. I was a VP of sales at GE for a period of time. Um, but I, I, I thrive on you know being a direct salesperson. I thrive on becoming that person for our customer where we're bringing them success. So I really found my calling. I really love it. Um, I love winning. I love helping others win, um, especially when I've been involved in the process. So I just, it's, it, I really love it. And why did you decide to be more of a rep than a, a leader? Is it um, just you know, after having tried both, and yeah. it's interesting because I have a mix of that now in my role because I yeah. need to, um, to work with others and lead them um, on some of my approaches. So I'm kind of doing a mix of both right now. Um, I just really, um, I, I loved being the, the person that worked close enough, closest to the customer. Yeah. And I really feel like that individual contributor role suited me for that being the thing that I really love to do. Cool. And how have you evolved as a salesperson? Um, yeah, it's definitely been an evolution. I mean, I pick things up along the way. Um, there's certain things throughout my career that I've always done and just did from the get-go. I guess they're just part of my DNA. Yeah. Um, things like taking a structured approach, um, for example. And it, it's just that so many things I learned along the way. I'm, I've probably learned more in the last two years about different things that I never knew in being in a matrix organization that I am now yeah. working my role. I've had to um, learn a lot and flex muscles I never had before. Um, but once I finally figured out that I really just need to approach working with my peers in the same way, working with customers and leading them to their, their promised land. Um, I've found and learned doing that same thing internally. It helps us all be successful. Yeah, that matrix organization can be a little bit of a change, huh? It has been a change after being a direct salesman. I talk about this every day with my peers and they know. I mean, after being a direct salesperson for 25 years and then stepping into um, an overlay or a matrix role in an organization that's growing like this has had so many challenges that I, I never experienced before. But, but I'm learning. I'm, I'm getting through it. Well, let's talk about that procedure. Um, how did you come up with it? What does it look like? Um, the, the how to work best internally procedure? No, no in or general. My own personal. Your own um, personal sales procedure. Um, so my own personal sales procedure is, you know, I really run, run sales like a business. I have a very structured plan and approach. 
Um, I really make a plan every year and then execute it and, and stay with it and stick with it. Um, I really take a look at the entire territory and I, I white space it. It's kind of the first thing I do. I look yeah. at what customers are already doing with us. I look at what else other value we could bring to them. Um, I look at the total dressable market for every area I'm working on and then I prioritize it. And I really stick to this plan. I mean, this is a long game. This is not a hit and run. And I create opportunity maybe there where it isn't obvious. Um, it isn't just about low hanging fruit. It's really about where can I create value and create opportunity um, in this white space for, uh, you know, for 2020, for example, this year. Yeah. Now, how do you prioritize? Is it based off of time of closure? Is it based off of size, most likely to close? Um, I kind of start with, it's, most, it's a balance of most likely to close and size, yeah. um, knowing where I'm going to spend my time. So, um, you know, there's definitely, you want to be able to get those wins in the meantime while you're working on the hard stuff. Right. So I'm really looking at that as well and, and taking a look at how, how just do I balance my time, my team, my resources? Because in sales, as you know, every, every minute counts and time is the currency. That's so it. it's really, really important to not waste it. And do you structure your week in a certain pattern? I could be better at that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, I think of it, um, I, I tend to think of it maybe in bigger chunks. I, I kind of think of it in quarters. Okay. Um, I also tend to think of it in months. So, you know, certain things that we're going to do throughout the year, um, you know, this particular quarter or this month, this is a campaign we're going to run. Um, so I tend to think of it a little bit bigger timeframes. Um, the, the week to week is an interesting thing to try to incorporate. Thank you for that. Yeah. I mean, because I always tried to do the opposite of what the company did because every company I was at, it was quarterly driven. Yep. So for, first quarter was, you know, busy meetings, QBRs and stuff. I used it for prospecting. And mm -hmm. then people didn't really get into uh, the role until the second month. But then in the third month, it was panic time because you had to make the number. Right. That's and, and right. Pa panic is not a good use of time. Right. Because right. You're, you're cutting the value of the deals. You're trying to shortcut it. You're doing things that you're going to then have to clean up the following quarter. Yeah. Have you have do you have a structured uh, quarterly pattern? Um, not not so much. Definitely from a company revenue perspective. But just to give you an example, you know, we were at sales kickoff. You know, third week of January, we're all in Vegas. You know the drill. Um, <laughs> yeah. We uh, as soon as we got back, um, I scheduled for the next two weeks um, with all of the. I, I work with eight different um, account executives that. So the way that we're structured is, you know, they own the count, they own the procurement relationship, they own the contract, but I own the line of business. And yeah. so I need to make sure that my line of business is first and foremost on their minds as they're putting their plans together and, and helping them put their plans together. Um, so I went off, my solution consultant and I teamed up yeah. and we went and scheduled uh, meetings with all eight of my uh, reps that I work with and their solution consultants. I went to every one of them face to face in the last two weeks, just completed that on Wednesday and put the 2020 plan in front of them saying, here's all of our customers. Here's a total addressable market. Here's where we, here's what they own and here's what else, you know, we could do for them and bring value to them. And then here's the ones I think we ought to go after first and so I got them on a plan very, very quickly. And so I feel pretty good here, you know, just mid-February, having wrapped that up, knowing exactly what we're going to go do, and also getting a, a deal closed 10 minutes before this interview started yeah. uh, that I've been working on for a year was, uh, was icing on the cake for me. So I feel like I have a good track forward. Cool. And give us a sense of what your deals look like from an economic standpoint. Um, so his, over history and not just current day, um, you know, I work in the any, you know, six figure, seven figure deal sizes, eight figure deal size, still working on getting that nine figure. Um, so that's pretty much the range. Um, I have sold, um, it's always been software for me. Yeah. Um, it's been on premise and software as a service uh, combined over the years. And what's interesting is when I worked at GE, it was literally on the tail end of the time sharing days. Yeah. Um, so I started off in software as a service and cloud without even defining it at the time. Did that first before I ever sold on premise. 
and then obviously went back to cloud. So I've, I've structured all kinds of deals, you know, multi-year contracts, um, pretty high numbers of ACV, multiple products bundled together, packaged, packaged solutions. And who do you call on? Who's the person that uh, makes the, either the usage decision or the economic decision? Um, where I am at today is yeah. the, a combination of the CHRO, CIO, and CFO. Um, historically, um, prior to my life um, in selling into um, like HR and employee workflows, um, I spent many years selling into supply chain. Um, that was always chief operating officer. Um, but there is always a, you know, a, a C-level executive tied to any of these deals and needs to be tied to any of these deals. Uh, the deals that I have experienced don't get done at below, you know, below VP. Right. Yeah. Because certainly, you know, pretty much anything over 50 K has to go up to them. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very few salespeople know that, but that's right. a pretty well kept secret. And what do you see as your differentiator from other reps? So it's really in my approach. Um, not only do I, you know, kind of have a structured approach towards the territory and towards my business, I have, a, I have a structured approach to every call. Um, and so, you know, business buyers, because I sell to the business, they don't know how to buy software. They don't buy software for a living. They want to solve their business. They solve business problems for a living. So in, they don't necessarily always know what the next step is. They may think the next step is three more demos, but really the next step is to move into a business value exercise yeah. once they're excited and hooked about what you offer. Um, in in previous roles, I was always one of the salesperson types that did not want to demo too soon. Um, you don't want to, you know, give, give away all your, you know, value is, is the demonstration and price. And once that customer has those two things from you, you know, that's why they disappear on you because you've given them a demo that they, they don't need you anymore. Yeah. Um, so I will always want to be needed. Um, and I want to help them through the process. And so um, in service now, because our product is so amazing, I, I do like to demo early now, whereas I may not have in the past, because that actually gets people hooked. They can really see what it is that we're doing. But then the very next step is business value. The next step is not price. And so I really work to walk a customer through and help them understand, because I know is when they're excited and when we're wrapping up that meeting, uh, first or second meeting, they know that there's all these other things that they need to do. Yeah. And the whirlwind is going through their head of, oh my God, implementation and contracts and how am I going to get this socialized, et cetera. And so I step them through that. And I do this in, as I close every meeting, I have a structured approach. I help them understand where we've come, so, come from so far. I check things off. I put dates on things. I start that timeline from when they want to be live. I work our way back. There you go. And I do yeah. it every single time. Yeah. That's it. I heard another sales expert say, you can't create urgency. I go, oh, oh yeah, you can. <laughs> yeah. It's yes. based off of their need. That's you know, right. If a doctor says you need a heart operation, you don't do it on your timetable. You do it <laughs> on the doctor's timetable. That's right. right. I just says, uh, in the next two hours, you're on the table. Or you mm -hmm. might not make it the next week. And I think a lot of people go off of their quarterly time frame instead of the client's outcome time frame backwards. That's right. And, um, you know, case in point, I just had a deal closed mid quarter. It was that that customer's timeline. Yeah. Not our, our timeline was December 31st of right. last year. Your timeline was today. Yeah. Our timelines when we want the summer house. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and you made, you brought up a great point because they don't know what has to get done. That's right. They, they, don't, they don't know. And if they don't know, that's how you end up with 15 Surprises. other things that yeah. didn't have to, that, that, that slowed the deal down by months and months and months. Um, and, you know, I also do things like, you know, we'll record our demonstrations. They can share those demonstrations with the one person who was not available on that day. Yeah. We don't need to restart unless um, we think we're going to get specific insight or value out of that one person who hasn't seen it, I mean, we'll absolutely do it again. But if it's just somebody who needs to see it, that really isn't someone who can say yes, then they can watch a, a, a rerun, uh, a review of, of what we've already done. So it's, it's, it's really worked well. I kind of really love Zoom now. <laughs> yeah, so do I, obviously. <laughs> but of now, course, that, nothing beats face-to-face. Uh, -face. Right. Now, you brought up the 
the business justification exercise? Is that what you call it? Or you? Uh, yeah, um, bit, you know, business value or just business case. Um, yeah. People have different terms for it, and it's really it's the it's what the customer is going to need internally to get. Not the just product. a quote. <laughs> That's right. It's it's the narrative around the value they're going to get, yeah. and it is the the cost and the return on the investment. That's it. And I think too many people just send a proposal and it's just a bunch of line items and a cost, no benefit. Right. And an executive looks at that and goes, oh, you think it's a good idea? Here's my pile of good ideas over here. That's right. A, yeah. And it goes nowhere. Right. And it's really important when you're selling to a line of business that's typically a cost center. So if you're selling into HR or IT or any type of back office operations, that that's going to fall below in the priority list than any customer or revenue generating system. And, you know, our client decision makers really need to have a, a great narrative. They need to have a great story and they need to back it up with numbers and it needs, the value needs to outweigh all the other priorities that are sitting in front of that executive for sign off. Yeah. And is that how you keep the deal from getting stuck? Is that the major tool? Um, it's, it's definitely, I think the, the, the structured approach, walking them through the steps, getting any of the parties, you, know, you have implementation as well. You have to get those parties involved as well. Getting, keeping the pieces moving yeah. and giving them the value is what I have found um, gets things moving. But then it's also, um, I'm a very big believer in when you give value, you're going to ask for and get value. Um, so real key thing for me is, you know, when I'm going to give something, I, I don't have a problem at all asking the hard questions. I, I'm going to ask for something in return and both parties need to be accountable. And without all those things, that's how deals just go into slippage mode, no compelling event, no deadline, yeah. uh, and they just perpetuate forever. Well, we'll get right. to it when we get to it. But, and that's it because they underestimate because they probably have never done it. How that's long? Right legal's going to take, mm -hmm. how long security, whoever the naysayers or the, the people who have to approve this, right. regulatory, whatever it is, or even the board. Yeah. And you know, sometimes you have to help the customer know who's going to be involved. Because for a business buyer who doesn't buy software every day for a living, um, they, they don't know that you know, procurement might be a surprise for them that that's a step. Yeah. Legal reviewing T's and C's might be a surprise for them. Um, they don't always know all the steps. They don't always know their own internal committees for budget um, and the process. So um, by just asking questions and helping them. And that's it. And they don't, if you don't either push it, nudge it and guide them, mm -hmm. these little surprises come up at the worst that's right. possible time. <laughs> that's right. I'm sure you've been in, you know, the round table with the CEO and the C-level people and all of a sudden they go, well, we need Harry to check this over. Right. And who's Harry? Who's Harry? <laughs> and Harry comes in and he's like, why wasn't I? What's the rush? <laughs> right. I'm going on vacation. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And knowing when those people are going on vacation is key too. I mean, especially when you're at the, um, you know, the very typical closing time for our business, which is end of calendar year, holidays. Um, you've always got to know, like, Who's already left for Christmas and how yeah. can we track them down if we need to? And yeah. electronic signatures has been one of the greatest inventions of the modern world. <laughs> it certainly yeah, you don't miss the paper. In, in those times, being able to send somebody an email for e-signature and forwarding it right to their executive, I think has really helped our business a lot. And as far as working with the C-suite, what do you do differently than a B player? Um, you know, there, there's times that, you know, sometimes if you're, if you're quiet in meetings, at least in the beginning, cause I'm in meetings sometimes where I'm leading them, but sometimes I'm sitting at the table, um, and not necessarily up in front of the, the PowerPoint. Um, I, you should just always, when you have something to say, like make it meaningful. Yeah. Um, and when you, when you do that, especially if you're silent for a little bit at the beginning of the meeting, I know I'm not very silent today, but if we were sitting in a meeting around the table, I'd really be taking in what people are saying. And I'd really find that moment in time to when I needed to say what I needed to say. And then I find just people listen. I mean, just speak with confidence, know your stuff. Yeah. Um, if you, and, and if you don't know something, 
just say you don't know it. Don't pretend. Right. That's such a credibility building item. And I think people may underestimate that sometimes. And I think a lot of salespeople feel obligated to talk. Yeah. Yeah. And instead of either being quiet or asking great questions. Mm -hmm. Because most people like to talk. That's right. And they just need a little warm up. They need a little, you know, get the ball rolling type conversation. Right. Oh, what do you believe about sales that uh, most people don't? That, it, that it's a real profession. <laughs> um, there may not be a degree in it coming out of college, um, but it's a real profession. I think it's the best profession. Um, it'll, it'll make you very, very successful if you, if you, you know, figure out how to, how to be good at it. Um, I have the opportunity now these days to mentor a lot of early talents. Um, I spent uh, year, many years at SAP uh, where early talent is a, a real key differentiator for that company. And they would ask um, folks like myself and my peers to mentor the, um, the early talents coming out of their academy. And so I got some practice with that um, over time and, and, and giving folks different advice and just watching people grow and learn. And what did you see them doing wrong most of the time? What were the common themes? Um, just, you know, a lot of, a lot of the typical things that, you know, you talk about on your podcast and, that, and actually that's what interested me in continuing to watch all the things that I saw from you because every one of them hit home. We've all lived and experienced that. Um, but you know, it's, it's a profession and I help, um, a lot of these early talents understand that like it's sales is just not a job. It, it's, it really is a way of life. I mean, I think I've been 90 some plus quarters now quarter after quarter. I mean, it, it, you really do structure your life around being in sales. Um, you know, we don't always get to take vacations as traditionally as most. Um, you can't really turn things off. There's just, you know, too many people you have to let, let know you're on vacation. Um, it's just, it really is a lifestyle and it, and it's a real profession That's and it. I'm I very proud to be in it. Yeah. It's not a personality type. It's a no. profession. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Cool. Hey, I appreciate your time today. Uh, where can people go to follow you? Um, so I am on LinkedIn. Um, so my, my uh, link is, I guess, will be a part of this podcast. It will. Um, uh, but really on LinkedIn, I, I do post a lot on LinkedIn specifically. Um, I'm not big on the, uh, the, the private Facebook, Instagram, um, but from a professional perspective, um, I, I do click on a lot of insightful things on LinkedIn. So uh, join me on LinkedIn and you'll be able to link to some great fabulous podcasts like this one from Brian. Thank you so much.